Welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, before we begin, I just wanted to um, note a few items. We have muted all lines at this point in time just to back, uh, minimize background noise and distractions for our guest speaker. I also wanted to let you know that this session is being recorded for educational purposes. Uh, and lastly, we will hold a question and answer period at the end of the session, um, at which point you can either unmute your, your computer line or you can type in through the chat box, which is located at the bottom of your toolbar. And so it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Sinha. He is here today to address cohesive living and long-term care. Over to you, Dr. Sinha. So uh, good afternoon, everyone, um, and maybe good morning to some others. Uh, it's a real uh, honor to uh, to be here today and, uh, and to have been invited by the uh, Ontario Association of Residence Councils to uh, to discuss this topic. So I look forward to um, spending the next hour uh, with everybody and um, and uh, sharing a little bit more about this project. Now I think we were I don't know if, uh, so Josie Lee has introduced us um, and uh, and I think she just asked that if I would just start off by just introducing myself a little bit. Um, you for those of you who are watching, um, you'll see. Um, I've got a title page there with all these titles, but uh, sometimes that doesn't really kind of make sense about who I am and what I do. Um, so first and foremost, um, I'm a, a geriatrician, means I'm a specialist physician um, uh, that's specifically interested in caring for older adults. Um, and uh, my practice as a, as a physician um, is uh, based in a number of different settings. I spend time practicing um, in a hospital, so seeing patients who have been admitted who are older um, and have um, acute medical and other issues. Um, but I also provide uh, care uh, in an outpatient clinic um, to patients who are from um, nursing homes and other settings and in their own homes in the community. Um, and I also do uh, telemedicine consultations uh, for folks who uh, can't come to me and see me. Um, and I also do home visits. So I do go to people's homes. I'll be doing that this Friday and do that as well. Um, I have a longstanding interest in uh, long-term care or, or care in our nursing homes um, in that when I was training as a geriatrician, I did that in the United States at Johns Hopkins. Um, and part of our practice was actually to work um, in a nursing home that we had as part of, um, uh, uh, of Johns Hopkins. So I had the privilege of actually spending two years um, overseeing a panel of 12 patients um, and working in partnership with the nurses, the residents council um, and my residents um, and helping them provide care within a long-term care setting. And so I developed a real strong interest um, and, uh, and that's kind of a little bit about my background. Um, and so um, having all of those different experiences, I like to um, stay involved not only in terms of delivering care, uh, but also thinking about how we can deliver care better across all these different environments where older people uh, in particular may be. Um, and so I also got appointed back in 2012 by the government of Ontario to help be the advisor or the lead advisor on the government's seniors strategy. Um, and so that gave me another opportunity to learn and work with many people working um, in the long-term care space uh, to understand what are the particular needs of those living in our long-term care homes, how are things evolving, what are the current challenges, but also what are the opportunities. Um, and so uh, the partnership with the Ontario Association of Residents Council has been great since then, um, and it was a real honor for Josie and the team um, to invite me to come in and speak around this issue at today's webinar. So with that being said, um, I'll, uh, I'll just... Uh, um, start my presentation and the goal that we have today is really um, trying to look at three different objectives. The three objectives are really to try and appreciate the diversity of care needs of those living in our long-term care homes, understand some of the current provincial and national efforts being made to improve the care and support of residents in particular, those living with dementia, and also recognize a bit about what residents and those not living with cognitive issues can do to better support their peers living with dementia in order to promote more cohesive living environments. Um, and this is really when I was talking to um, some of the leads, um, they were saying that this is kind of a growing challenge for some of the residents, that we have such a diversity of folks living in our long-term care homes that sometimes it's challenging if you're a resident who 
doesn't have cognitive issues about how do you exist in an environment where many other people do have cognitive issues. It can be frustrating, it can be challenging, um, and, um, and it's hard to kind of live um, in harmony and cohesively um, when we're living with some other individuals who have challenges that make it hard to um, communicate and, uh, and integrate well with everybody else. So these are real challenges. These aren't you know, minor things. Um, and so they were asking for my insights and then invited me to, um, to do this webinar. So I don't, I, I'm gonna tell you in advance, I do not, uh, I'm not gonna give all the answers. Um, I don't have all, I don't have a silver bullet today but I thought maybe a few of my perspectives could be helpful um, and maybe can spark a, a bit of a conversation um, and maybe a bit of an interest and maybe some thoughts around what are next steps that uh, resident councils and other folks can do um, to try and help um, take this issue a bit further. So when we think about you know, living, um, uh, why can living with individuals with cognitive issues be so challenging? These are some of the issues or thoughts that uh, we came up with, for example. One, it's not, not always clear when someone's challenging behaviors may be due to a dementia, mental health issue, or their personality. I think, as all of us have known, that's, you know, right from when we were young, um, you know, we, I was just at an event last night with some of my colleagues, and a lot of them have young children, um, and some of them will say, oh, my child, you know, they're not a good sleeper, and others say they're a good sleeper, or, or they have this terrible, like, demeanor around them, or whatever the case is, right? And so you always, and none of these children, you know, these young children have dementia um, that we know of. They don't seem to have mental health issues, but they're all really unique in terms of their personalities, their behaviors, you know, and, and it's one of those opportunities where just as young children, we're kind of kind of getting to know them and getting to know their temperament, how they react, what works well, what doesn't work well. Um, and I know my colleagues last night, we were driving home um, with their little one who's only 12 months and and they said, well, we need to get him to bed soon. And I thought, well, why? I mean, come on. And they said, well, look, if we don't get him to bed soon, you know, it's gonna be a disaster for the rest of the night. And I said, fair enough, they're getting to know um, they're, they're the newest member of their family and, you know, these are aspects that we could say are not really related to dementia or mental health, but more personality, behaviors, temperaments, all those sorts of things. But obviously that when we're living in long-term care environments, we know that there's a higher prevalence of things like dementia. Um, there, there can be a higher prevalence of issues like mental health issues, but there's also those aspects of personality, um, traits, um, all those things that have shaped us throughout our lives to become who we are. And so sometimes when someone has challenging behaviors, we don't really know, especially if we're another resident and not necessarily a healthcare professional, you know, what are those behaviors due to? Um, and how do you untangle them? And how do you deal with them well? Uh, because ultimately all of us just want to live peacefully and enjoy our environments. Um, but sometimes it can be challenging to understand when there are challenging behaviors, what's behind that. Um, and so these issues are sometimes unpredictable. Um, you know, you don't know when they're going to happen. Um, they can be annoying um, and they can be troubling for other, to others for a variety of reasons, right? Um, you might be a person who likes peace and quiet, um, but you might have a, a colleague living, um, you know, kind of where you live who may have repetitive vocalizations um, and they might be saying, help me, help me, help me all the time. They might be asking you, um, the time every five minutes and you're thinking, I just told you five minutes ago and you just want to read your book or you want to watch the television or this person's fidgeting and pacing all over the pace. And this can be challenging because sometimes you're starting to wonder, like, are they trying to annoy me? Um, why are they doing this? Um, you know, you know, why are they pacing so much? Why are they so fidgety today? Um, and it's hard to understand that, especially if you may not have some of those extra pieces of knowledge um, to understand kind of why they are the way they are. Um, and so it can be challenging, it can be distressing, um, especially when, um, uh, when one might be living with another person who may be having a lot of challenging issues or a number of other people. So these are, again, these are serious concerns um, and, they're, and they're real concerns. And so, and it's just helpful to understand why they can be bothersome. So um, sometimes, again, we're not certain around how best to approach someone with challenging behaviors. Um, do you ignore them? 
you just kind of say, I'm just going to try and ignore it and just, and just pretend like it's not happening? Do you confront them? If that person's telling you the sky is green, the sky is green, is it better just to try and correct them and say, no, the sky is blue, the sky is blue? Uh, maybe that'll work, right? Maybe if I if I keep telling them that they're actually saying the wrong thing, or telling them that you know they're saying, uh, um, you know, I want I want my mom, and saying your mom's dead, your mom's dead. Maybe that's the way I should do it, right? But then you realize if you do that, then they get really upset because you know you just told them that their mom is dead. Um, or how do we make things better for everyone and and, and not worse? Um, I apologize for some of the typos here, um, but how do we make things better for everyone and not worse? And I think that's the key thing is when we're trying to live cohesively, um, we want to kind of figure out, you know, what are the things that I can do to try and make things better for me, for them, um, and not make it um, something that becomes even more distressing for everybody um, at play. So I guess that's the question is, where do you start first, especially when you may be living with someone who may have cognitive issues or may have other issues as well? So let's review some of the aging processes here, because I think this is the key thing, is that not everybody who's living in a long-term care home is an older person, right? We have to remember that we have people of all ages who are living um, in long-term care homes, mainly adults, really, um, but there can be some folks who are in their 30s, who are in their 40s, um, um, and we have other people who are in their 60s, their 90s, or even above 100. Um, and so we have to remember that one of the things that's very common is that we more likely have more older people who have been experiencing aging for a number of decades. And so we have to remember that as we get older, um, it's not uncommon that our memory and cognition change and evolve as we get older. So we know that as we get older, our memory tends to not be as sharp as when we were younger. It kind of slows a little bit, but we have to remember that dementia is not a normal part of aging. But it's not uncommon that as we get older, we see folks who have what we call normal age-related memory loss. Some people may be more affected and they might develop something called mild cognitive impairment, where you have significant memory challenges, but you can still do all of your tasks on your own without any help. And then there's dementia. And dementia is when you actually have serious memory and thinking challenges that also interfere in your ability to complete your tasks on your own. And we know that this is actually a very common issue amongst those living in a long-term care home. We also know that hearing and visual changes can be really common as well, especially as we age. And about 25% of people um, living in long-term care homes um, have um, hearing and or visual um, difficulties. Um, so they may have things like glaucoma or cataracts or macular degeneration. They may be really hard of hearing. Um, and these are all things that you combine that with what was just being talked about with cognitive and memory changes. And you start realizing that, wow, okay, well, this can be quite a challenging uh, situation for a person to be living with when they might not be able to see or hear properly uh, as well. And we know that even pro people who can't hear, they sometimes actually present as a person who might have a memory or thinking problem, when really the underlying issues, they just can't hear you. And that's why they can't understand what you're trying to say. Um, we also know that as we get older, um, you know, our bones and our muscles start to change as well. Um, and we start seeing a decreasing amount of muscle mass and bone mass. Um, and that's what I mean by skeletal and muscle changes. And that leads to what we call osteopenia, and or sarcopenia. Osteopenia means less bone, uh, bone cells and sarcopenia means less muscle cells. That's why we start to shrink as we get older. Um, our muscles aren't as robust and these can lead to things like osteoporosis as well or what we call brittle bone disease. So lots of different changes are happening in our bodies as we age and we have to always keep that in context because now when you start putting those hearing and visual issues and you pair them up with some memory and thinking issues, you can realize that you know, just that you're an older person living in a long-term care home, they're not just an older person, but they might be an older person struggling increasingly with some of these issues that may make it hard for them to function and live independently um, and may make it harder for them to communicate and interact with others. So just to give a bit of a sense of, of what do I mean by just, you know, to, to help people understand a little bit about how we could think about this from a visual perspective, um, here are some slides that really um, help to show us what it's like when you have, you know, normal vision versus when you are living with a cataract. 
This is what it's like when you're living with age-related macular degeneration. And this is what it's like when you're living with glaucoma. And I think this is, I, I really like this slide because I think for some folks, for example, um, you know, for example, I'm very blessed as an individual because I have normal vision. But until I saw these slides, I never really appreciated as a student, I would read about what it would be like, you know, to have a cataract or age-related macular degeneration or glaucoma. But I found these images really powerful when I saw them because it really now makes me understand why having more larger print font can be really helpful for someone whose vision is blurry. Um, why the importance of contrast, right? Black lettering on white backgrounds, um, um, those sorts of things really can help people who might have visual problems see things better. Um, and these are some of the things that really we can do to help people who might have visual impairments. But sometimes when it's hard for us to appreciate what a person living with cognitive issues or hearing issues or visual issues might be, might be um, it's hard to empathize and understand and therefore understand why we sometimes have to adjust what we're doing to try and make everybody's experience better uh, from that perspective. So just this hopefully will be a kind of a powerful reminder um, to remember what other people might be experiencing uh, from that perspective. So when we start looking at what are some of the common care issues faced by long-term care residents, for example, um, one of the things that you may be aware of um, is that uh, our nurses and the staff in our long-term care homes about twice a year are doing um, um, what we call formalized assessments um, that are able to help us to understand what do our long-term care residents look like um, and what are some of the issues they're facing? And this is often, um, these are what we call the intri or the NDS assessments that you may see some of the folks doing. Um, and these are really powerful care planning tools because they can help the doctors and the nurses and the therapists in, 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 in the home um, really start to appreciate maybe what are some of the unique challenges that someone might be having. But this is also the source where we get really, really rich data, which has helped to, uh, help to illustrate for us how the landscape or the population living in a long-term care home has really evolved over the last few decades. So we know that those living in long-term care homes have become increasingly more complex, if you will, over the past decade. Um, and so CHI-HI, which is the Canadian Institutes of Health Information, they store all this data that's being collected in every single home across Ontario and pretty much every home across the country. And what they showed is that 87% of residents are living with some type of cognitive impairment and 69% are living with a dementia. So those are significant numbers, especially when you think about 10% of all those people who are 65 and older in our in our society are living with dementia, but in a long-term care home, about 70% are living with a dementia. 87% are living with some cognitive impairment. So again, if you're an individual who might be living um, in um, a long-term care home and doesn't have dementia, you're in a really, really, really small minority of the residents who are there. Um, the next thing is when you actually look at um, those who are having behavioral challenges or issues, 50% were reported to have a behavioral challenge. 31% uh, were experiencing depression. And just to give you a sense, we know that in the general population, the number talking about me having mental health issues is about 13%. So we have higher prevalence of dementia, prior prevalence, higher prevalence of dementia, higher prevalence of mental health conditions like depression as well. Um, and so this is helpful to understand a little bit about why we see more challenges with um, dementia and behavioral issues within long-term care environments. Here's another piece was that it was saying that 82% of, um, of residents also required extensive assistance with their care or were dependent for all of their personal care needs. So it means that not only do we have a high rate of, of, um, of folks living with cognitive impairments of dementia, or mental health issues, but a lot of people living in long-term care homes need a lot of assistance from the staff um, to meet their basic personal care needs. Um, and so it's really helpful when we have this data because it helps us to understand who our neighbors are and, and who our residents are within our long-term care settings. 
Um, in terms of when we start thinking a little bit further about um, as the care needs in long-term care homes become more complex, we know there's a growing recognition that with this growing complexity, there needs to be better support for both the staff and other residents living within a long-term care home. Because you can imagine that when, when folks tell me what um, that people used to, it was very common that when a long-term care home was built 20 or 30 years ago, there'd often be a big parking lot because a lot of the residents had cars and were driving all the time. But that's not really kind of what we see today for the residents living in long-term care. They often have greater levels of complexity. They're not a, often able to drive and do those sorts of things. Um, and so this is where we often see um, that with that growing complexity, there's been a greater recognition that we need to better support staff, but also other residents living within a long-term care home, because these are definitely um, different kind of populations than when we had 20, 30, or even 10 years ago. So Ontario, for example, has been making some key investments through its Behavioral Supports Ontario program. Um, and these have been investments to help staff better address behavioral issues amongst residents um, as well. But this is interesting because this is, these are initiatives that are often, I think, more focused on helping staff to better address behavioral issues as opposed to residents themselves. And while care quality in some aspects is improving overall, um, how do we also support the needs of resident peers as well who don't um, have these same issues and needs? So what I wanted to talk a little bit about was um, Ontario's dementia strategy, because this is some of the work that's been happening over the last few years to recognize um, the needs of the evolving needs of people living in long-term care homes and how we can better support um, those who are struggling, especially with dementia, um, which we just said before, um, about over 60 something percent of those living in our long-term care homes you know, are living with dementia, but also a significant number having behavioral issues as well. So Ontario um, launched its dementia strategy um, a few years ago, um, and you'll see that there were a number of different um, initiatives that were being supported and organized um, to better support people who are living in the community um, and people who are living in long-term care homes as well. Um, and so people will have access to these slides and they can look at this overall, but you can see that there were, there were initiatives being supported to support caregivers, things to support people living in the community, um, how do we better support care partners um, with education and training, how do we better support the workforce? How do we support people living um, in long-term care homes, but also in the community? Um, and that's the five and six that you'll see there. Um, and also thinking about how do we better support patients to navigate better? Um, and how do we support better uh, investments in physician education um, and also uh, provide better awareness around dementia, what it is, what it isn't, et cetera. So these are some of the things that were being done. And what I wanted to highlight in particular was these were some of the things that really focused on what's happening within within the long-term care space. Because sometimes people say, has anything been done to kind of address some of these growing issues? Um, and the good news is, is that um, some of the new funding went to provide additional staff, and that's to the far, uh, far right here, um, is that you'll see that there was an investment to enable um, our regions to help um, hire more specialized staffing to enhance um, the behavioral supports Ontario services in long-term care homes. Um, and that translates into um, you know, new staff, if you will, um, to help um, provide support. But I think, again, a lot of this is really meant to help staff um, working in our long-term care homes as opposed to other residents as well. And so my conversation with the um, um, OARC staff was really illuminating because it made me think that maybe we have a bit of a gap, especially for residents who don't have cognitive issues um, and certainly are affected by um, uh, when their peers are living with dementia or behavioral issues as well. So the key is like, are we actually doing anything better, right? So I've talked to you about some of the investments, for example, to help support staff um, and other initiatives that are happening across the country. Um, as well. And the question is, are we actually getting any better? Um, are we delivering better care 
um, for long-term care residents with behavioral issues? And I think the answer is yes, because despite the growing complex care needs, the quality of care continues to improve in a number of key areas. And this is a good news story. So again, all of that data that I was telling you that folks are collecting, at least on a twice annual basis um, in our long-term care homes around residents, are ways in which they help measure their quality um, um, and, and help uh, you know, hold themselves accountable to say, how can we do better and how do we compare ourselves against others as well? So we know between 2013 and 2018, the use of restraints, for example, these are physical restraints to manage the care of residents with significant behavioral challenges actually decreased from 9.6 down to 5.7%. This is on average across the country. And the good news is Ontario actually has the lowest rate of restraint use in the country um, at about 4.5%. I think the highest rate, I believe, I'm not gonna name the province or territory because I'm gonna get it wrong, but I think it was about 15%. So you can see the significant variation, but this is a good news story that a lot of good work's been happening with the staff in our long-term care homes to try and minimize the use of restraints. The other thing that has been looked at is the use of potentially inappropriate antipsychotics. And what we've seen is that the use of these things has decreased from about 30% to about 21.2%. Alberta has the lowest rate around 17.1%. 7 Ontario is around kind of the average. Um, and there's some areas um, um, where the, the prescription rate is up to 34%, so one in three um, residents. And this is specifically looking at um, those residents who are getting antipsychotics um, and don't actually have a diagnose as a, 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 an issue with psychosis. So there's no clear indication as to why they're getting these medications. Um, and these are medications that are sometimes used to try and help people who have significant behavioral issues. So we're trying to significantly reduce the inappropriate use of these medications um, you know, in residents across, because these medications can have significant side effects and cause harm as well. So, so there's some good news happening. But what about residents without cognitive issues? Again, this is a group, again, a small group, but a group that still, you know, these are people who have to live with everybody else. Um, and sometimes these, these issues can be equally distressing to them. So despite the growing uh, work to better support staff and long-term care residents with cognitive issues, have we forgotten about other residents and their needs? And so there is a better staff, there's a bet, there is better staff training and resources available, but are there better ways to support residents to deal with behavioral issues um, of their fellow residents? And what sort of training would be helpful for residents without cognitive issues to feel better equipped to manage difficult situations related to behaviors of others? Um, and I don't think we've really done enough work around this issue to say that there's something that's easy and off the shelf um, and just a matter of something that we can just easily implement. And I think this is what sparked the conversation I had with some of the folks at the OARC um, to maybe start prompting a conversation about what can we do to support residents without cognitive issues who um, want to live more cohesively with others as well. Um, and so what I wanted to focus on a little bit was, I'm not saying this is the answer, but this is actually a program called the Gentle Persuasive Approach, which is now um, led to the training of over 300,000 staff members working in hospitals, um, in community settings, including long-term care homes. Um, and it's an approach that's been developed um, by a group here in Canada um, but it's something that maybe we can have some insights towards as to maybe this is something that's usually to train staff, but maybe there's some insights that could help some of the um, residents who may not be living with cognitive issues and who are on the webinar today. So the gentle persuasive approach is also known as the GPA. Um, and this is a comprehensive practical education program that equips caregivers with the skills, knowledge, and confidence to care for others with dementia who may become upset or frustrated. And it supports those who regularly interact with persons with dementia to notice signs of agitation early before responsive behaviors happen. And it emphasizes that usually all behavior has meaning behind it um, and it often is time limited and it's the result of an unmet need. This is their overall philosophy. Um, and I think there's a lot of honesty in this philosophy as well, is that often when people are doing something, they're often doing it for a reason. Um, they're not always doing it forever. Um, and sometimes, you know, it might be hard for someone to express how they're feeling 
Um, and so they may be acting out in a certain way. Um, and again, you know, I don't like to ever compare or try and uh, use the, you know, say that it's the same thing. But again, I was just telling you at the beginning how I was spending some time with my colleagues' children yesterday. Um, and, you know, for a lot of these young, young children, they couldn't speak yet. Um, but if they were getting fidgety or fussy, um, again, for their parents, it was always kind of like, okay, why are they crying now? Um, are they hungry? Um, do they have to go to the washroom? You know, what's going on? And so that's often a helpful paradigm for us to think about that often those behaviors that we see in very young children often is meaning, it's often time limited, and it's a result of an unmet need. So how might we actually take that same interpretation and think about older people um, or, or even adults uh, or older adults who may be having some behavioral issues? And how, if we use that same philosophy of thought, maybe this better helps us appreciate how we could better support um, our colleagues as well. So understanding a person often helps to understand one's needs and can minimize the potential for behavioral issues. And we'll talk a little bit about this more. So first of all, um, you know, the gentle persuasive approach teaches us to think about what are some of the potential signs of agitation. So a person might be fidgety, they might be quite restless, they just don't seem to be able to sit still or, or they just can't lay down. There's something like not right. Um, you know, sometimes we might see that they're just kind of seeking, they're exit seeking, they're just trying to leave, they're just trying to leave, you know, and they're, they're trying to go somewhere and you're trying to figure like, where are you trying to go? Um, or you might be trying to, you know, do something with them and, and, and they're just refusing care. They're, they don't want to be touched. There's something going on there. Um, and so these might be some, some of the potential signs. These aren't all the signs, but these are sometimes things that we can witness that can be helpful for us to kind of say, okay, well, they seem to be a bit agitated or something's going on, but what's going on and why? And the potential causes can be, again, as I was saying before, maybe they're hungry, right? They're just hungry and they can't articulate that they're hungry. Um, maybe they're scared, right? They're frightened about something. Something, you know, just doesn't feel right. And we're not sure, you know, and, and they're frightened and that's why they're a bit restless. <clears throat> um, sometimes they could be in pain. Sometimes people don't want to be touched because they, you know, they're actually in pain. They don't want to be moved because they're in pain. But if we can treat their pain, then they actually would feel okay. <clears throat> and maybe they're not able to express this verbally. So, next is when we're thinking about addressing, excuse me, I have a bit of a coughing fit here. <coughs> so, addressing unmet needs benefits... Um, from understanding an individual's personal preferences and can be important to diffusing a potential situation as well. So sometimes if we know um, that a person, what a person likes, what a person doesn't like, um, that can be helpful that we make sure that we don't do something to actually make them more upset or agitated. Um, and sometimes if we know what a person likes, um, that can allow us to help diffuse a potential situation. So maybe there's something they always like to talk about or something they get very excited about um, and it's easy to distract them. So for example, um, a really good friend of mine's mother, um, she's got quite advanced dementia um, and, uh, and sometimes when she gets quite agitated, um, what we do is we have um, a little stuffed dog that she really loves because she used to love raising dogs when she was younger. Um, and I remember when I was interacting with her because she's also my patient, um, she, um, she was getting quite agitated. And then my, um, um, my friend, her son, you know, basically brought the, the, little, the little stuffed doggy and said, you know, mom, do you want to pet the dog? And I said, oh, that's a lovely dog. And she immediately grabbed and she was just so happy to have her, her, her little doggy with her. Um, and it just immediately diffused the situation in that way. And it was helpful because, you know, my friend was able to tell me that, you know, she really, I said, you know, does she like the stuffed toy? And he's like, no, she, she actually now thinks that this is a dog. Um, and she used to raise dogs and dogs are really important to her. Um, and he said, so we figured out, dad and I figured out that, you know, when things are getting a bit hairy, we just bring the dog into the picture and it really helps diffuse things. And that was really help because that really stemmed from an understanding um, of her background and, and how we could do something, um, you know, to kind of, again, diffuse things. So what are their likes or dislikes? You know, do they like music? You know, what hobbies do they have? 
you know, how do we get to know um, that individual? Because sometimes we can find some common ground or we can find things that we know to do or not to do um, that can really help kind of um, um, to support them. And again, this knowledge can be used to, used to be kept calm, steer conversations, and also influence behaviors as well. So three of the key tips uh, that the gentle persuasive approach you know, kind of teaches is understand the individual you're, you're interacting with. Know them as a person, their likes and dislikes. And so one of the neat things that I've seen um, in some of the long-term care homes that I visited, for example, is they might have a little bit of a who I am kind of thing um, that's available um, and, and not just for the staff, but also, you know, for their fellow residents, right? And you might learn really interesting facts, right? A little bit about who they are, what's important to them, what do they like, what their favorite color is, what their TV show is. And these are sometimes those things that staff members can, um, but also other residents, you know, when they know that information, it helps them to get to know their fellow residents. Um, and sometimes it can be useful information for them to better relate to um, and support their peers as well. Um, often speaking to the individual slowly and providing enough time for them to process the message can be important as well. So remember when I showed those slides that talked about the number of people who might have visual or hearing impairments, or they might have some cognitive challenges already, that actually might make it hard for them to pick up on things when you speak quickly, or you don't use a deep enough voice, for example. Um, so sometimes you might need to speak a bit more slowly and a bit more clearly so that they can actually hear what you're saying because sometimes if they don't hear what you're saying um, then that can irritate them a bit further as well and also sometimes it's a matter of kind of trying to adjust our activities around the person to fit their unique needs so for example we might know that you know this person might not like to do this sorts of things or do that and so we might say that this is something that they can give a pass towards or there might be a different way in which we can engage them well in that activity that they certainly don't like to sing but they like to do this or they like to do that so getting to know that individual can often be a way to actually help maybe figure out activities that they like um, and and how we can better support them so i know certainly when i was working in, um, in the long-term care home that I was in, in in Baltimore, I remember it was really helpful. We often spent a lot of time with the staff um, and the families to get to know our, our patients. So I had one, one patient who used to work uh, for a long time in a laundry. Um, and so, and she would always be quite fidgety, but we used to just give her a whole pile of towels and she would just love to sit by the window and just fold and fold and fold and fold and fold all day long. And when she didn't have something to do, she would often get agitated. Um, another person, um, she used to, um, for many years, she used to um, run a daycare and she used to look after very young infants and so on. Um, and so she found it very comforting sometimes if she was getting upset, it was if we actually had a doll that we could give her, for example, um, she would find it very comfortable because she would just cradle and she was just so gentle and caring. Um, and again, you know, this is something where, you know, to her that she could actually do something that was very comforting and enjoyable to her. Um, so by finding things that brought um, that person comfort and soothing is uh, sometimes a way in which you could provide that support. But it was never with yelling or trying to cajole someone, but it's always making sure that even if they're agitated, and that when I was approaching, or we'd always be taught, you know, just speak slowly, speak clearly, you know, speak gently in a soothing way, because often that can help to de-escalate a situation as well. So finally, I just want to mention a little bit of the work that's happening, because some of you may have heard that recently um, there was the release of the new National Dementia Strategy. Um, and so this was just a little bit of some background. But in June 2017, um, there was an act that was passed um, to demand the creation of a national senior strategy, uh, or sorry, a national dementia strategy. Um, and the, uh, and, uh, and the, uh, with this, um, there was a ministerial advisory board on dementia um, that was established um, to advise the Minister of Health on matters related to the health care of persons um, with Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. Um, and so in the recent federal budget, it was uh, they announced that they were going to provide 50 million over five years to support the national dementia strategy that was actually announced just a few weeks ago that further um, um, uh, builds on other investments that have been made in recent years as well. 
And so in terms of Canada's national dementia strategy, it really focuses on a few different things. One is that it really focuses on trying to improve public awareness that reduces stigma. It promotes supportive community um, and early diagnosis. Um, it really focuses on trying to promote prevention of dementias, but also early diagnosis and intervention. Um, it really talks about increased access to support for families and care partners, including information, training services, and financial support. Um, it looks at try to how do we support um, um, health care providers? How do we support the provision of more care, uh, coordinated care that's integrated across settings? And then how do we also um, support the research activities that um, can help uh, tell us what causes dementia? but also effective treatments and better ways of caring as well. So this just gives you a sense of what's being thought about at a national level and how that helps to start complementing some of the work that's already been ongoing in Ontario as well. So finally, just to draw some conclusions and then we'll have plenty of time for questions is really thinking about a few things. Right now, we know that residents living in long-term care homes are living with more complex health issues than ever before. Creating a cohesive living environment is particularly tough for the minority for a minority of residents um, who don't have cognitive issues. And then we're training staff better to care for residents with cognitive issues, but can we also offer training to residents as well? And I mentioned as one example the gentle persuasive approach, which offers advice that can be highly practical for residents as well as staff to better work with people with dementia. Uh, and so maybe that's something that we can draw upon to say, is this maybe a way that we can provide some support and training for residents as well, um, so that they can, um, they can feel that they're equipped in ways to help them create a more cohesive living environment. Um, and again, dementia strategies at the provincial and federal levels can be enablers to better supporting everyone living in our long-term care homes as well. So thank you very much, and I will leave it over to the organizers, um, Jennifer and Josie, who uh, will probably take over from here. Thank you, Dr. Sinha. Uh, at this point, everybody, um, it is now our question and answer period, so we do have a healthy amount of time. Um, at this point, you can either unmute your uh, individual lines or you can type in through the chat box, and I can kind of facilitate those questions over to Dr. Sinha. So I'll give everybody a couple of moments and then as questions start coming in, I'll begin reading them out. And perhaps Dr. Sinha, while we wait on, um, on people kind of gathering their thoughts and then reflecting on what you've spoken about here today, um, one of the questions I know that we hear a lot um, from, our, from our board and from uh, residents living in long-term care homes is really struggling with some of those practical um, approaches and I know you, you spoke to them today but perhaps you could kind of wrap that information into um, you know a real life day-to-day -day example around you know what might be a supportive response um, when you have a resident uh, wandering or walking into your room or, or your private space how, how, how may you respond to that? Yeah, and I think this is, it's an example of, you know, like, you know, one of the, one of the challenges can be that um, often when we, when we don't appreciate, I think sometimes when we, when we don't appreciate, um, or we don't keep in the back of our mind that this person probably isn't trying to annoy us, isn't trying to cause a problem, um, but it, because they have cognitive challenges, um, they might do things like wandering into other people's rooms, or they might do, they might be doing things. And so I think by seeking to understand, it allows us to maybe not immediately react in a negative way, where we start yelling at someone saying, go away, go away, and, and leave me alone. But kind of, you know, you know, reminding someone saying, you know, Sally or John, you know, you know, you know, hi, Sally, nice to see you. Just this isn't your room, you know, do you want me to help you, you know, get back to where, where you need to go, for example, because it's, it's changing the tone sometimes that we can, we can easily get upset, but sometimes um, using that kind of, um, you know, understanding and then trying to find a way to redirect or provide some support or advice can be helpful. Um, so sometimes there are just ways in which we can reframe how we're seeing a situation um, and, 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 and then try some other techniques like, again, 
a calming voice, um, seeking to understand, you know, you know, are you looking for something? Because this is my room and, and how can I help you? Find, do you want me to help you find your room or what are you looking for? Um, and sometimes just by gently redirecting, um, that can be all that needs to be done. If there's something where it's like happening often, 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 and, and for unclear reasons, it's also something where I say, you know, get the staff involved and say, okay, I'm noticing this is happening more and more and it's kind of annoying, like, is there something I can do? Because then sometimes you can get even more creative by saying, you know, um, depending on where someone's room is located, uh, maybe a very just convenient walking pathway. So sometimes you can disguise someone's door um, so that people will kind of just walk past it as opposed to walking into it. Um, there's just different little things that sometimes people can do to try and help um, help to try and maybe change and shape behaviors as well. Thank you. One of the other questions um, one of our participants had is, is they're wondering if there's an education forum that could be provided um, that could help re residents adapt to that communal living environment. Yeah, no, it's great. And I don't, and, uh, and this is, I think, part of our conversation uh, before is I don't know if that exists. And this might be, you know, um, an opportunity for, you know, the, the uh, residence councils to say, if this is something that we're seeing is actually common enough, um, that maybe there is something that we can do to talk with the creators of, say, the GPA work, for example, and say, is there kind of a short module or maybe, for example, in homes where many of the staff might have undergone training like GPA or there's other programs like PIECES or You First or whatever, maybe they could do a special session, you know, sharing some of the techniques they've been taught with the residents themselves, right? Because often it's the staff who know the residents, but for these particular residents, maybe having their own in-house seminar uh, might be helpful, especially when we recognize this might be a group that we're missing as well. There was another participant who was just looking for some feedback around how we may address the normalization of behaviors in long-term care. How do we address the normalization? Um, can we get a little bit more information around that in terms of what do we mean by normalization? This was actually received through the, the registration uh, feedback form. So I'm actually not sure uh, which individual on the line today um, wrote that in, but I'm, I would assume, um, you know, really, really looking at um, it, the, how people are expecting or normalizing um, some of these behaviors as this is just the way it is. So kind of breaking out of that, you know, this is just the way it is and, and really addressing it um, as a, a rising concern or, or an issue. Yeah, and I think the idea is, yeah, I, I can see that. So if we look at it from the term, if, if the meaning was kind of the normalization that sometimes people just say, well, you know, like just get used to it. This person's gonna be yelling all the time or they're gonna be fidgety all the time. Um, sometimes that's just kind of, it's, it's it, you know, it's frustrating for everybody because for example, you know, maybe a staff member gets to go, you know, on, you know, they're only there for a certain shift every day, but, you know, for many residents, you know, this is your home. This is, you know, these are your neighbors and you've got to endure this 24 seven every day. Um, and so sometimes when people normalize or quick to normalize and say, this is what it is, you know, get used to it, as opposed to seeking to understand that maybe there's something behind this that we can address and address it better. So for example, um, uh, we had a patient who was admitted to our behavioral support unit um, um, next door at Toronto Rehab uh, because they were becoming quite agitated all the time. Um, and it was interesting because when I started reading through their notes, um, I could start seeing that it all started all of a sudden one day, three months ago, um, and at times they would remark that they were having some pain in, in their back and a specific very point. Um, but, you know, everybody was trying to deal with the fact that they were agitated, that they were always irritable and were trying all these different medications and not getting much relief. Um, and I was kind of saying, well, maybe there's something behind this, right? Because it seems like every once in a while they talk about their pain in their back, but they don't talk about it all the time. So when I talked to the, the, this individual um, and, you know, reading through the notes, you know, I, I determined that they actually had suffered a vertebral fracture 
um, three months ago. Um, so they had osteoporosis, brittle bone disease. They actually uh, fractured one of their spinal vertebrae. And that's why they were in pain. And that's why they were just irritated. But their dementia prevented them from explaining to someone, excuse me, I think I've had a vertebral fracture and that's why I'm having all this pain. And so by us understanding, seeking to understand what was driving this uh, um, and knowing that untreated pain was the big issue here, once we started treating them with, with standing acetaminophen, uh, all of a sudden, you know, they're, they were pain-free and they were no longer behaviors. Um, so that's an example of if we normalize behaviors and say, well, that's just the way it is. Um, well, then that wasn't going to solve the things. Whereas if we try and always try and say, what could be driving this? Could it be pain? Could it be hunger? Could it be this? Could it be that? Because when we start asking some of those questions and, um, and realize uh, there are some opportunities to treat, sometimes that can make things better as well. We have a question here from a resident who's uh, participating on this webinar this afternoon, um, and they're just asking, uh, how does a person of their age, so 59, deal with the whole floor of seniors that are nonverbal? Do you have any advice for this individual? That's tough, right? And I and if 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 this if this uh, if this person can share a little bit more, perhaps you know that would be helpful because I could. Um, because you know it's challenging if you're living on a floor where nobody else can talk to you, but you can certainly talk. Um, that's challenging, right? I could only imagine how challenging that might be. So I, I want to make sure I get, I get, I have a good response. But all I can say is I empathize that if you're the only person who's verbal on the floor, I mean the other ch the uh, the opportunity can be is that. And also, you're a resident. You don't necessarily want to always be talking to the staff, especially if they can be verbal. But sometimes it might be an opportunity to say, are there ways in which, if you're the only verbal person on the floor and everybody else is nonverbal, you know, are there other residents in the building who are verbal? Is there some sort of venue or way in which you can get together with them on a more routine basis so that you can have a chat group or you can have an opportunity to meet together and talk together? Because um, sometimes it's hard to change who you're living with or the room assignments, or you might like your room and you might want to stay in your room, but it's it's challenging when there's nobody else you can talk to. So, you know, are there ways in which you can interact with staff in certain focused ways? Or it, are there opportunities to interact with other more verbal residents? Um, but I don't, I'm hoping that I captured um, or maybe gave some ideas that might be useful for that resident. But if they want to share a little bit more about um, if I'm missing something about what they're seeking more information around, I can, I, I'd be more than happy to give some further advice. So it looks like there are their team members just supporting them and, and gathering a little bit more information. Perfect. Okay. Well, well, we we have a few moments to see if we have any more insights. So happy to hear more. So I'm I'm hoping, um, you know, again we've got uh, at least 30 um, 30 groups of attendees who are on on the phone here. I hope I haven't said any. I mean, I'm just going off of my basic experience of what I've learned, you know, from my my limited experience working as a geriatrician um, and some of my work within long term care. Uh, but I have a lot smarter people who are listening here on on the line, and I hope I captured issues correctly or pretty hopefully it made sense and hopefully I didn't say anything terribly offensive or rude or whatever um, but any anybody who could tell me if I if if this made sense if this was helpful um, that would be nice to, so otherwise I feel like maybe everyone's silent or there's a lot of silence because maybe they're just waiting for me to stop but people aren't aren't clicking off here people are staying here till the end so um, so I, I take that as a sign of reassurance So Dr. Sinha, the, the resident um, is sharing that um, they, they are doing um, some of the things that you had suggested, but just expressing that it can be very difficult upon returning to the floor where they where they don't have anybody to, to speak to on a regular basis. Yeah, fair enough. And, and, and so thank you. And I really want to thank that resident for being willing to share um, because sometimes it's tough to kind of 
um, share with with others, you know, kind of how they're feeling because um, you know this is your home and and you want to live in an environment. It's it's amazing when you're surrounded by other people. Um, but it's tough when you're living with other people who can't communicate with you the way you want to communicate, communicate, communicate with others. And so, you know, sometimes the other conversation can be is that with the director of care or with the staff is that if, um, you know, if there becomes another vacancy on the floor, for example, in future, uh, if there's another room that becomes available, you know, maybe they can specifically try um and and see if there's another verbal person you know who can be paired up on the floor with um or you know or if there are if 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 you if this resident has formed a bond in particular with a person living on another floor um who also has a vacancy like where uh, where, where there becomes a vacancy you know maybe that's worth a move to be to create a bit of a cluster of of folks where as you said it's not just when you return to the floor there's no one to speak to but maybe that's a way to correct a situation where you always have someone to speak to on the floor. You know, that's provided you get along and you want to talk to them. But uh, that's a whole other piece. So those are just maybe some of my other suggestions to say that might be an opportunity to look at as well. We have another comment here from uh, Sharon Cook, a resident leader. Um, and she's just commenting, saying that it's so important to spend time with individual residents and their families. Um, and really emphasizing the use of personhood tools and, and getting to know each person really well, uh, building relationships with them uh, one at a time. And she's just mentioning that that doing so has really helped her uh, to lead her council and, and to speak for um, people who cannot speak for themselves. I think that's really nicely said. And I think, Sharon, that's that's um you know that's absolutely really important because I think sometimes, you know, and again, this happens often very easily in hospitals, for example, where people don't know, uh, they don't have the time to get to know the people they have the privilege of caring for or living with, right? Um, and you often find that, you know, people have the most exciting and interesting stories um, and they have specific interests and things. And, and when you can find those ways to relate, um, it creates a, a much closer bond of friendship um, and, and care. Um, and uh, and so there is a real value in getting to know people um, because it can allow us to really pull on many other things that can help us interact with that those individuals better, especially when we have shared interests or opportunities to find connections. So our time here is, is coming to an end. So I just wanted to say a big thank you to Dr. Sinha for, for addressing this raising challenge. I know it's a, a complicated one to dig into, um, but you've really saw the value um, that residents and the role that residents can play in, in supporting their peers. And I can say as an organization, we're really looking forward to continuing this conversation. Um, and I think this afternoon for all of our participants, you've really provided you know, great direction and advice, but greater than that, you provided hope. So, so thank you for your time and for agreeing to um, uh, put on this presentation for OARC. And thank you to everybody who took the time today to, to join us and to participate. Thank you very much. Have a great afternoon, everyone.